So you have this, uh, what, this obscene father, that is the, the, and of course it's just this is a, a symbol of lots of other things that in, under the guise of permissiveness, we are going to tell you what to feel and what to think. You see this all the time in contemporary American society where we say, we want you to be tolerant, we want you to be free, we want you to be accepting of everyone, and so we're going to train you how to do so. We're going to show you training manuals of what kind of language to use, what kind of, what kind of behavior to have with other people. We are going to actually make, by giving you more tolerance, we're going to, we're going to also impose on you a code of politically correct speech, politically correct action, so you have politically correct desires. Um, this is what Zizek finds so intriguing about um, a contemporary postmodern society. Uh, he talks about the pleasures uh, of obedience. For psychoanalysis, Zizek writes, the perversion of the human libidinal economy is what follows from the prohibition of some pleasurable activity. Not a life led in strict obedience to the law and deprived of all pleasure, but a life in which exercising the law provides a pleasure of its own. And that's really important for Zizek. It's not just that we're fighting against the law, it's just that the law becomes a form of pleasure on its own. A life in which performance of the ritual destined to keep illicit temptation at bay becomes the source of libidinal satisfaction. That is, the very act of prohibiting other people from getting pleasure becomes our pleasure. That's what interests Zizek. Um, it's too simple to say, well, what I really want to do is uh, go out and have a wild party. Um, what, you know, and and I'm, being a, I'm, I'm not allowed to do that because of the mean old law, uh, the mean old rules. That's not interesting for Zizek. What's interesting for Zizek is the way in which exercising the rules, exercising the prohibition, becomes its own kind of pleasure, becomes its own game of, of, of erotics. Um, so uh, he talks on, on pages seven to eight of, about erotic repression, erotic repression. Regulatory power mechanisms, he writes, and procedures become reflexively eroticized. Although repression first emerges as an attempt to regulate any desire considered illicit by the predominant socio-symbolic order, that's the first kind of repression, it can only survive in the psychic economy if the desire for regulation is there. This is really the key. That not, not that we fight against regulation, but we have a desire for regulation. The very activity of regulation becomes libidinally invested and turns into a source of satisfaction. We get off on the rules from Zizek. It's not about freeing ourselves from the rules. It's about the rules becoming their own source of enjoyment and how the, that can be perversely uh, put into uh, the polity, into the society. Um, so uh, he says, the trick performed by the superego is to seem to offer the child a free choice. In the case of, that ex of the obscene or postmodern father, remember that? Uh, in that situation, the trick performed by the superego is to seem to offer the child a free choice when, as every child knows, he is not being given any choice at all. Worse than that, he is being given an order and told to smile at the same time. Not only you must visit your grandma, whatever you feel, but you must visit your grandma and you must be glad to do it. The superego orders you to enjoy doing what you have to do. Find pleasure in work. Find pleasure in obedience. This, for Zizek, is the true perversion because um, it insists on a different kind uh, of conformity while it, uh, under the guise of tolerance, under the guise of tolerance. One of the big approaches to psychoanalysis is that it's only a theory of individual pathological disturbances and that applying psychoanalysis to other cultural or social phenomena is theoretically illegitimate. It asks in what way you as an individual have to relate to social field, not just in the sense of other people, but in the sense of the anonymous social as such, to exist as a person. You are, uh, under quotation marks, normal individual person 
only being able to relate to some anonymous social field. What is to be interpreted and what not is that everything is to be interpreted. That is to say, when Freud says Unbehagen in der Kultur, civilization and its discontent, more literally the uneasiness in culture, he means that it's not just that most of us as normal, we socialize ourselves normally, some idiots didn't make it, they fall out, oh, they have to be normalized. Not culture as such, in order to establish itself as normal, what, what, what appears as normal, involves a whole series of pathological cuts, distortions, and so on and so on. There is again a kind of a, a, a unbehagen, uneasiness. We are out of joint, not at home, in culture as such, which means again that there is no normal culture. Culture as such has to be interpreted. So he says our postmodern society has a kind of rule saturation. So he says on page 10, our postmodern reflexive society, which seems hedonistic and permissive, is actually saturated with rules and regulations which are intended to serve our well-being. Restrictions on smoking and eating, rules against sexual harassment. So there's all of these rules become their own uh, form of, uh, of uh, pleasure, um, a, a, even as they control us uh, uh, more and more. Zizek is fa fascinated, for example, of, of how we, um, we create things that we, um, uh, uh, that uh, create objects of desire um, which have evacuated from them all the things that made them desirable. <laughs> so you want, ca you want decaffeinated coffee? You can have decaffeinated coffee. You want, um, you want uh, light beer, it, you know, without, or light beer without alcohol. Uh, or uh, there's a whole range of things that, that, that we, we, we still um, get to have the, the label over the object, but all the things in the object that were bad for us, which has made them desirable, um, uh, 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 are, are gone. Here's a, here's a, we'll give you a clip here of uh, Zizek on, um, on uh, chocolate laxatives, which he thinks of as the, the perfect example uh, of this kind of regulation uh, as, and, and production of pleasure. So for Zizek, duty becomes a pleasure. The superficial opposition, he writes, between pleasure and duty is overcome in two different ways. Totalitarian power goes even further than traditional authoritarian power. What it says, in effect, is do your duty. I don't care whether you like it or not. Totalitarian power says, in effect, not do your duty. I don't care whether you like it. But you must do your duty and you must enjoy doing it. This is how totalitarian democracy works. It is not enough for the people to follow their leader. They must love the leader. Duty becomes pleasure. And then pleasure becomes duty. He says the obverse paradox is that pleasure becomes duty in a permissive society. Subjects experience the need to have a good time, to enjoy themselves as a kind of duty, consequently feeling guilty for failing to be happy. This, you see this in the happiness psychology movement uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. People are measuring happiness all over the world. And if you're not happy, it's not, you're wrong. It's not wrong. You, you have to be more happier. You, you should feel bad about not being happy. You, have to, you should feel guilty if you're not happy. Happiness has become the, the new command. If you're, if you're not uh, uh, happy, you must be worried. You must be uh, neurotic or pathological. Um, how many times do people come up to me in my job, which they imagine is intense, and they say, are you still having fun? And of course, the only answer you can give, if people say, are you still having fun, you're supposed to say yes. Nobody really wants to hear it. If you say, no, I really hate it, they, they, they're embarrassed on what to say. It's like a confes confession of some sexual perversion. I'm doing my job because I'm paid. No, 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 that's bad. You should do your job because you love it. It should be your passion, right? You should do your job because it, you, you love it, because only thing we should do are things that give us pleasure. For Zizek, this is a totalitarian democracy. Under the guise of being nice, we want you to enjoy yourself, we want you to be happy. What they're really saying to you is, um, we, you must love what you are told to do.
just like the kid going to grandma's house. You know, happiness is for me a very conformist category. It doesn't enter, it doesn't enter the frame. You have a serious ideological uh, deviation at the very beginning of uh, famous proclamation of independence, you know, pursuit of happiness. If there is a point in psychoanalysis, it is that people do not really want or desire happiness. And I think it's good that it is like that. For example, let's be serious. When you are in a creative endeavor, in that wonderful fever, my God, I'm onto something, and so on, happiness doesn't enter it. You are ready to suffer. Sometimes scientists, I read history of quantum physics or earlier of radiation, were even ready to, to take into account the possibility that they will die because of some radiation and so on. You know, happiness is for me an unethical category. And also, we don't really want to get what we think that we want. The classical story that I like, the traditional male chauvinist scenario. I am married to a wife, relations with her are cold and I have a mistress and all the time I dream, oh my god, if my wife were to disappear, I'm not a murderer, but let us say, uh, drop me, it would open up new life for me with the mistress. You know what every psychoanalyst will tell you quite often happens, that then, for some reason, wife goes away, you lose the mistress also. You thought, this is all I want, when you have it there, you turn out that it was a much more complex situation where what you want is not really to live with the mistress, but to keep her as a distance, as an object of desire about which you dream. And this is not just an excessive situation. I claim that this is how things function. We don't really want what we think we desire. Um, so uh, a pleasure uh, becomes uh, a duty. Uh, so what are the possibilities for transgression in such a situation? This is a hard question for Zizek. It may be that actually performing the most uh, old-fashioned uh, rituals of, of oppression become new forms of transgression against the, the soft, permissive uh, uh, oppression of postmodern, what he calls totalitarian democracies. What Zizek is wanting us to understand here, I think, is the way that pleasure and power get intertwined. Um, he does that not because he actually has a recommendation to make about way, the way we should liberate ourselves uh, from this intertwining of pleasure and power. He doesn't have a political program. He's not asking us to help the poor. He's not asking us to get rid of the rich. He's not asking us to, to uh, increase production of consumer goods or decrease the production of consumer goods. So what is he doing? What is the value for, of Zizek's uh, work? For, for, from his perspective, is, what he's doing is playing the role in some ways of an analyst, a philosopher as, as psychoanalyst. That is, he's asking us, what can we possibly mean by what we are doing? What, can we, what do we think we're up to when we look at ourselves in these particular ways? Why are we asking the questions we're asking? Why are we um, framing the world as we are framing it? This is the task of the philosopher. The philosopher isn't going to feed the hungry. The philosopher isn't going to clothe the needy. Uh, the philosopher, as Zizek says in a clip we can uh, point you to, uh, you know, the, the philosopher is not there to avoid catastrophe. If you see a catastrophe looming, uh, as he, he says in one, in, in one of his interviews, if you see there's a big comet coming to Earth, don't call a philosopher. <laughs> you know, call some uh, nuclear engineer who could blow the thing out of the sky, right? Uh, if you, know if you, if you want to know what the, what the, uh, what the tsunami is going to do, don't, uh, don't ask a philosopher. At least I can do it at least traditionally in two lines, no? Philosophy does not solve problems. The duty of philosophy is not to solve problems, but to redefine problems. To show how what we experience as a problem is a false problem. If what we experience as a problem is a true problem, then you don't need philosophy. For example, let's say that now there would be a deadly virus coming from outer space, so not in any way mediated through our human history, and it would threaten all of us. We don't need basically philosophy there. We simply need good science desperately to find. 
we, we would desperately need good science to find the solution to stop this virus. We don't need philosophy there because the threat is a real threat directly. You cannot play philosophical tricks and say, no, this is not the truth. You know what I mean? It's simply our life would be, or, okay, the more vulgar, even simpler science fiction scenario. It's kind of Armageddon or whatever, no deep impact, a big comet threatening to hit Earth. You don't need philosophy here. You need, I don't know, to be a little bit naive, I don't know, strong atomic bombs to explode, maybe. Maybe. I think it's maybe too utopian. But you know what I mean. I mean, the threat is there, you see. In such a situation, you don't need philosophy. I don't think that philosophers ever provided answers. But I think this was the greatness of philosophy. No, not in this conversation saying that the philosophers just ask us questions and so on. I mean, what is philosophy? Philosophy is not what some people think, some crazy exercise in absolute truth, and then you can adopt, you know, this skeptical attitude. We, true scientists, are dealing with actual, measurable, solvable problems. Philosophers just ask stupid metaphysical questions and so on, play with absolute truth, which we all know is inaccessible. No, I think philosophy is a very modest discipline. Philosophy asks a different question, the true philosophy. How does a philosopher approach the problem of freedom? It's not. Are we free or not? Is there God or not? It asks a simple question, which would be called a hermeneutic question. What does it mean to be free? So, this is what philosophy basically does. It just asks, when we use certain notions, when we do certain acts and so on and so on, what is the implicit horizon of understanding? It doesn't ask these stupid ideal questions, is there truth? No! The question is, what do you mean when you say this is true? So you can see, it's a very modest thing, philosophy. Philosophers are not the madmen who search for some eternal truth and so on and so on. So what do you ask a philosopher? You ask a philosopher, so why are we concerned with the possibility of catastrophe um, when we have catastrophe all around us already? Why do, we, why do we frame the world the way we do? Why do we ask the questions the way we do? Why do we accept certain kinds of answers in true, as true and not others? How do we manipulate our expectations for freedom and pleasure in ways that clearly make us more miserable? These are the kind of questions that the philosopher doesn't answer, but throws back to us. Throws back to us because there is no foundation for an answer. There's no telos for political practice. There's just the possibility of reframing the way we think about the world by being more aware of the frames that already exist. Well, that's about all we can talk about this week, uh, although the issues are very complex and there's plenty more to say. Uh, but we'll go on to a, a new set of, uh, of, of ideas and issues uh, next time. See you then.